title is Relationships, Loving One Another. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to John chapter 13. And I want to begin here because and do just a little review. Uh, where we're coming from with this is that if we're going to be the people of God that represent heaven on earth, it's all about relationships. The kingdom of God is about a relationship with the king and a relationship with one another. If that's true, which I believe it is, then it's very important that we understand the power of relationships and the power of the relationship basically is loving one another. And remember they asked Jesus, what's the greatest command? And he said, well, the greatest command is that you love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that you would love your neighbor as yourself, the second. Then, then Jesus later here in John 13, verse 34, says, A new command I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I, th I think he's making a point there when you... When you say, since he says, love one another three times in two verses. Um, and he says, this is a new commandment. Well, of course, it's, it's not really a new commandment, but it is a new commandment to the degree and the depth of what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, we were supposed to love God and love our neighbors ourselves. But the truth is, I'm, I'm saying now, the standard that you are to love one another by is the way I've loved you. Now, of course, we know that Jesus went to the cross and died for us. So he's calling us to loving in a self-sacrificial way. It's this love that God wants us to demonstrate to one another. He wants us to demonstrate that to the world around us. And the last message I talked about this is the, the expression of that love is actually in forgiveness. It's really an attitude that we should develop of just of continually forgiving one another because it's practical love in action. Really coming to a point, I pray that we can come to this point to where we just, we've, we've already predetermined that we're going to forgive. No matter what somebody says, no matter what somebody does, you know, and again, it's always those close to you. It's always relationships. It's husbands and wives and children and parents and parents and children and work people you work with and people you go to church with. But those are the only ones that are going to get close enough to you to really cause you to have problems. And that's where the enemy is always trying to work. He's always trying to get an opportunity. And that's one of the ways he gets opportunity. We get into unforgiveness. Again, he is doing everything possible to separate us from one another. He wants to separate us from God. He wants to separate us from each other. Because again, if the kingdom of God is built on relationships, and it's through the loving one another that he's going to do everything possible to mess that up. Now, today, I want to take this just a step further, because, again, if we're really going to express love to one another, there's another issue we've got to deal with, and that's anger. Anger is a huge problem today. It's a problem in the church. It's a problem in the world. You think about the various things that are going on, the rage that goes on, and people killing each other, and the stuff that goes on really all over the world. And it's fueled by uh, an unbelievable power of anger. And so, if, again, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to begin here today talking about the issue of anger. Anger and unforgiveness, I debated which comes first. Well, either way, they're both issues that we have to deal with. Ephesians chapter 4, very interesting. Paul is giving instructions here. And I just want to begin in verse uh 26, it says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Pretty interesting verse. Uh, what he says here is he, he tells you to be angry. Uh, you know, most of the time we've probably been raised in church. We're always told, don't be angry. You know, don't get angry. But the reality is what he's saying here is be, ang be angry. Uh, not, not saying that hey, everybody run out there, let's get angry at stuff. And what he's saying is, is that anger is an emotion, and you've got to understand that you will and do get angry. You get upset. Uh, as we grow even in the Lord, the reality is we get angry over injustice. We get angry when things are not, people are not treated right. We get angry over things that are just not the way God wants them to be. But we also get angry over some other issues too. 
And so the bottom line is, is that we've got to deal with anger. It's got to be dealt with properly. Uh, if you don't deal with anger properly, uh, it's either going to be two ways. It's either going to be you're going to stuff it or you're going to release it. And usually in unhealthy ways in both of those. But what he says here is, says, be angry and sin not. Now, I've shared my testimony uh, many times here. Uh, growing up, I had a terrible temper. And uh, even as a little little boy, I'd tear up things and break things and, and uh, expressed it in very not good ways. And then when I got into, uh, got into school, uh, I'd end up getting in fights. And then uh, I'd have, just about every day, I'd have a fight with someone. Uh, then I played sports, and so it was, uh, it was encouraged. <clears throat> uh, but I mean, playing football and things like that, there was a place to express that. And uh, even I played baseball, even through college, and uh, got out of college, and there was no place to really express that hostility. And, and never really knew where it came from, never knew what it was, in church the whole time. And I remember we would uh, I'd express it in different ways, break things, tear up things, and and Susan would say, that was, that's just, that's not of God. And I, I know it wasn't, but I really couldn't control it. And I would try to control my temper, and she would, I'd play golf, and I'd break golf clubs, and throw golf clubs, and I could throw the golf club further than I could hit the ball. <laughs> and uh, really, really bad. And <laughs> sound like helicopters out there when I threw those golf clubs, too. <laughs> I could sail them. Uh, I would have to carry, I, I'd have to buy just about a new set of clubs every month because I'd break, them so, I'd break so many of them. I'd also carry two or three putters because I'd break or throw away my putter. And uh, on one particular game, I had, uh, hadn't been putting very well. And so I was on the eighth hole and threw my putter away. It was the last putter I had. So I had to go out. It was, this is, it was the field out there. So I'll go out in this field to get my putter. I'd just thrown away. I found a putter I'd thrown away a couple of weeks before. I came back with two putters. That's a true story. Obviously, I didn't putt too well on that particular hole. <laughs> and Susan would ask me why they come home. We'd say, well, did you lose your temper today? I said, no, no, I didn't. She said, oh, that's so good. I said, no, I still got the temper. Unfortunately, I'd love to lose it somewhere. But, but it was terrible. It was a horrible deal. And, it, and throughout this whole time, I wrestled with trying to control my temper. And, uh, you know, and then finally, obviously, it's very ungodly. And that's really what I got delivered of in August of 82 at that James Robinson meeting. I got delivered of a demonic spirit that was causing me to explode. And I understand how people can, with anger and rage, can kill people. I mean, it, 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 it flares that fast. And it is, it, mine was tremendously demonic. Uh, though all anger and temper is not, but, but that particular thing was. I got delivered of that. I still get angry. But again, because anger is an emotion, but it's, it's so different than what I had then. I'll share some more about this and how to really, how I got free. But it says, be angry and sin not. So obviously, Paul is giving us something to, we can handle the anger. And uh, the, how you handle the anger is basically, he tells you right here, be angry. You've got to acknowledge that you're angry. First and foremost, whatever you want to get free of, you've got to recognize, I am angry. I, I'm really, um, you know, deep down underneath, I'm really angry. But how do you not sin? Well, you, if it's against someone, you forgive them. If it's against something, whatever it is, you forgive them. Forgiveness, again, is the key because it's love released in practical ways. Now, another way that you can really, we got to understand the power of what Jesus has already done. Keep your, keep your place in Ephesians and turn to Hebrews chapter 4. This is a uh, passage of scripture that I've been, uh, I, I feel like God woke me up to this a, a, just a few weeks ago and was saying that this is a real key. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, 
Here's my point. He says be angry, and it doesn't mean just to explode all over the place. What he's saying is acknowledge that you're angry. You got to get connected to the reality that we can say, oh, I'm not, I'm not angry. Well, you, you look like you're angry. You act like you're angry. Well, I'm not angry. You, know, you never, we're never going to get anywhere until we own the, the feelings and the emotions. And you've got to get in touch with that and say, yeah, I am angry. But what do you do? You go to the throne of grace. Because Jesus has, is our high priest, which means he is the intermediary, he's the mediator for us. So we can go to him because he's already gone through everything that you could possibly ever go through, yet without sin. And he is there for us. It's not like we have to run to him and try to persuade him. No, he's already paid for everything for us. So we go to him and say, I'm angry. I need, to, I need the grace and the mercy to really forgive. And I'm telling you, he releases it. And he gives that to you if you understand he's already paid and already, already done all that for you. So it's not like you have to beg him to do something. He's already done it. But you've got to go to him. It's not going to someone else. It's not griping to somebody else. It's not telling them how, how bad you were abused and how somebody treated you bad. No, it's going to the throne of grace to receive grace and mercy in time of need. And going to Jesus, who has already paid, and he's already been tempted in every way that you've been tempted and that we've all failed, except he didn't, and he didn't sin. So what we have to do, we have to acknowledge that I'm angry, then we got to go to the throne of grace, and there is grace there for us to forgive and to release and to bless. Now, when do you do this? We'll go back to Ephesians. When it says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And what that means is, is that you've got to deal with it aggressively, and you've got to deal with it quickly. I, I'm just telling you, when you're upset, when you're angry, when somebody has done something wrong, <clears throat> or somebody has, has violated you, you've got, to, you've got to get after it immediately. Because if you don't, what it does, it turns into bitterness, and that bitterness will turn into wrath, that which is a rage. It turns into, it just boils in you if you don't deal with it, okay? So... Here's what you do. You've got to acknowledge that that offended me. That hurt me. That bothered me. And I'm angry. But I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go to the throne of grace. I'm going to go to the Lord. You've got to help me here. He will help you because he's already paid. His strength is available. I love what Roland shared this morning. His strength is available. And from there, we can forgive from the throne of grace. And I just choose, again, it's not a feeling, because again, your feelings, anger starts hitting those feelings and your emotions, and you start getting riled up. So you've got to choose as an act of your will to forgive and to bless and to release. That's why forgiveness, if you were not here, listen to the message on forgiveness, because we can forgive because the forgiver lives in us. So, and you need to do it as quick as you can. Try not to ever go to bed upset and angry. Try not to ever do that. Now, let me... Uh, now, that's the, the answer to what you do with on some of the, uh, really how we deal with anger. But okay, here's another issue. What, what if we just have long-term anger problems? The, the, you know, that usually won't work. I'm talking about really having issues that are long-term. You know, where, where do they come from? Well, to be really honest, uh, in my own life, it was a curse they came through my family. Now, my family, there was not an anger problem in my family. In my, and I've shared this before. What came from was the issue of shame. My mother, uh, mother, my grandmother, got a divorce when my mother was six. And uh, they lived in Frisco, a big town of about 400 people at that time. It changed a little bit over the years. But somehow, some way, I don't even know previous to that, but somehow shame entered into the family. At six, I grew up on the farm. At six, they closed the little rural school, and everybody had to ride a bus to, to the big town of Corsicana. Now, somehow, to me, I felt different. I'm the kid on the farm having to go to the town to go to the school, and that shame that was in me opened the door somehow to that temper. And I would get angry and upset because I felt different. It was shame working in me. Uh, it was years later before God ever showed that to me. I actually got delivered and was a long time before really that revealed what was the real root issue. But if you're dealing with long-term root issues of anger 
it could be a generational curse. It could be something that's in the family. It also could be learned behavior. You just learn that in the family. It could be whatever it is, it really doesn't matter. The bottom line is, is that there's a lot of, pe- lot of us are st- and a lot of people in the church are dealing with deep-seated, long-term anger issues. And here's the other problem. Uh, I've talked about when we forgive. I've talked about the same thing in fear, the same thing in anger, the same thing with unforgiveness. You know, I can think that I'm fine. You know, it's like taking your cup and having it two-thirds full. I'm, I think that's zero. But, folks, it's not zero. You're, that's why you explode. That's why you have these problems, because you go, well, I don't know why I do that. Well, it's because your cup is full. And how do you get your cup empty? You forgive and release and choose to bless, and you've got to work on that. Same thing with fear. A lot of times we don't understand that we, we're living in a level of fear. It drives us and does all kinds of things. But this anger deal is something that is there. It's very, very important. So you've got to recognize that you've got, again, first key to getting free of anything is recognize, hey, I've got a problem. And the solution is always through Jesus Christ by going to the throne. But anyway, it's, those are issues. Uh, obviously, when you're hurt and offended and wounded, uh, the, a lot of the root causes of anger are because we've not really forgiven. Now, again, we think we've forgiven, especially if it's been in church, or I've forgiven. Well, remember in Matthew 18, he says you must forgive from the heart. So God is wanting us to really forgive from the heart and release and to bless. And a lot of times we've not really fully done that. Lots of issues. The point is, is that uh, Jesus is the answer and healing is available for us. Uh, lots, of, of lots of things in life. There's unfulfilled expectations. There's loss of loved ones. There's uh, rejection. I mean, we can go into a myriad of, of issues. Uh, your rights have been violated. Sometimes there's, there, are, there are actual violations. All those things, but the bottom line is, it's not so much, you know, what caused it. The issue is getting to say, look, I am angry. And most of the time, what, the way we we're really are set free is that we choose to forgive and to release and to bless the, whoever and where the original anger has come from. Now, that's the key, again, is going back to where it originate. Could have originated in the womb, could have originated in early childhood. It could have originated something that somebody did to you, but it goes back to forgiveness. Now, as I said earlier, it can manifest in two ways. You can stuff it, and it turns passive. Uh, we call that, pa- it calls passive uh, dealing with, with the anger. But the problem is, is that it's still there. You know, we can, we can stuff it down. What do I end up doing, though, is that we still... It still manifest to people around us. A lot of times when we stuff it, we turn uh, apathetic toward others. Like, I don't care. You know, uh, or we just, we cut people off completely, won't even communicate with them. Or we ignore them. Uh, we purposely ignore them. I mean, that's just all forms of anger. And uh, it's just internalized in different ways. But the bottom line is, it still manifests itself. Do you realize that some addictive behavior is because of anger? When you open the door to the enemy, he does all kinds of things. I, I didn't finish that Ephesians passage. It says, give no place to the devil. Because when you are angry and you do sin, you literally give legal ground to the enemy. And so he'll come in and bring all kinds of stuff. But a lot of addictive behavior is actually because the root issue is because we are actually angry. Uh, manipulation, control. These are another manifestations of being angry. Uh, all kinds of things. Um, But the bottom line, though, if you aren't careful, if you stuff your feelings and your anger, it's going to turn into depression. And not all depression is based caused for anger, but some is. So you've always got to examine that. If I stuff my feelings uh, and I've stuffed them down, it's just going to wear you out. It's going to tear you apart. And it's it's just rooted there long term. Now, obviously, if you don't stuff it and you're aggressive in that, uh, it can turn violent. It can be uh, expressed in verbal or physical abuse and all kinds of things. So none, none of that obviously is good. Here's the bottom line. Anger is a problem in relationships. Do you want to be around an angry person? Do you want to be around a person that is 
volatile. Do you want to be around people that, you know, people say, well, you know, nobody can tell. Hey, listen, you can tell. All you got to do is be around somebody and you can feel that, that tension and stuff in someone. And the truth is, we, you don't want to be around somebody. You don't want to live with somebody like that. You don't want to work with somebody like that. You just don't want to be around that. Again, how in the world are we ever going to be a living testimony if we're walking and carrying anger? The truth is, if God sets us free, then we can help others get free, because I'm telling you, it is a major, major problem. Now, turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 4, and I want us just to look at the reality of where this all came from. Obviously, all sin comes from the devil, but <clears throat> Genesis chapter 4, uh, I know you just tell the story, it's Cain and Abel, they bring a sacrifice to God, and Cain's is not received, and Abel's is. And let me just re begin reading in verse 5. It says, but he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. You do realize that anytime we're angry, that everybody else can tell. You know, we think, oh, I'm not angry. I've had, I had somebody tell me that one time. I said, I, I, you know, you're really angry. I'm not angry. Okay. You know, I can tell you're not angry. Hmm. <laughs> but, you know, isn't it interesting, though? I mean, I mean who are we kidding? See, we're only kidding ourselves because we're not kidding anybody around us. Everybody knows if we're dealing with, with anger. So it's the same thing. God said, uh, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desires for you, but you should rule over it. Amazing passage. I mean, here we have in the very beginning of the scriptures, we have a picture of sin personified literally means it's crouching at your door, and, and his desire, the old King James says, is for you. But you should rule over it. Wow. Now, if that's not the picture of a demonic spirit that, that's waiting for you to open the door, I mean, it's going, get angry. Well, come on, get heated up, get upset. Let me in. That's exactly what this picture is. And what did he do? Well, he goes on to say that he talked with Abel, verse 8, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Wow. What a question. Are you your brother's keeper? See, the reality, yeah, we are. We're to bear one another's burdens. We're we're connected together with the family of God. And yeah, we are. We're supposed to love one another. How? As Christ did, laying his life down. So, I mean, what amazing passage here. So he killed his brother. He said, Why? what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you're cursed from the earth, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Till you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Now, here's the point. The Bible says in Matthew that if you, you said you shall not murder, if you have murder in your heart, you've already murdered. So we're talking about heart issues here. But listen, we may not go out and kill people, but we do with our mouth. We speak evil, we gripe and complain. And we speak things out, which is the same as what we're doing, as what Cain did. We're killing our brother. We're not loving our brothers as one another. We're not loving as Christ loved us. So speaking out negative things is literally we're, we're releasing murder. And what does it do? It breaks relationship. You cannot have a relationship with an angry person. You just don't. And what it causes for the person that's angry, that's doing that, it causes them to be a wanderer and a vagabond. They have a hard time ever connecting anywhere. Relationships are shallow, and you'll constantly be moving around. Now, aren't you glad we don't have any of that problem? Now, one more thing. Who is he angry with? Who was Cain angry with? God. That's right. Now turn to Matthew chapter 11. And we'll close here because 
usually I will try to go from the root issue forward, but today I've started at the how do you deal with it on a, on a daily basis and working it back down. Matthew chapter 11 came to pass and Jesus finished verse 1. He commanded his 12, they had departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. When John heard he who was in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. He said to them, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who's not offended because of me. Now, I have shared this before. This is so important. John is well aware of the scriptures. He's well aware that Jesus has already pronounced his his job description out of Isaiah 61. And in that job description is setting the prisoners free. Now, he knows that. Now, here he is in prison. Let's put yourself in John's position. I'm in prison. Okay. I am the prophet that hath pronounced the Messiah, Jesus, is coming. This Messiah that I have identified and baptized clearly is the one who sets the prisoners free. And I am in prison. Therefore, go and ask him to be sure he's the one. Because obviously, right, obviously, he's going to go set me free. He's going to get me out of prison. And so they come and they say, are you the one? And he says, and Jesus says, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And then he turns and says, blessed is he who's not offended because of me. And here's what happens. I'm telling you, we, a lot of us are walking around offended at God and angry with God. And we don't know why we're angry with people because ultimately we're angry with God. Because God hasn't answered our prayers the way that we wanted them answered. Our lives have not gone the way we thought they would go. Marriage is broken up. We prayed and prayed and prayed for it to be restored. We prayed for our finances and ended up going bankrupt. We have prayed for so many things. We believed for a loved one to be healed. They were not. And I'm telling you, it's so easy to be offended at God. I'm telling you, the devil does everything possible to try to blame God for every bad thing that goes on in this world. And God is not the author of sin or death or sickness or all this junk. He's not the author of that. It came through sin. But he wants to, he wants to blame God. And he wants us to be offended at God. John the Baptist got his head cut off. And you go, well, wait a minute. That didn't make any sense. It probably didn't to John the Baptist either. You understand what I'm saying? Or his disciples. Why, why would he not? Why would he not do this? And others, why, 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 why? I don't know. I don't know why. All I know is that God is good and that God is love. And just because he doesn't answer my prayers the way I want them answered in my time frame, he's still good and he's still God and he's still love. And, I, and it's not on his, in his end. I just either don't understand or I'm not, under, I'm not fully in sync with him. So I don't understand all the things that go on and why they go on. But I know this, the enemy is constantly trying to, be, trying to get us offended and angry at God. Now, here's the problem. If he can get you to that place, where do you go for help? How are you going to go to the throne boldly? If you actually are angry at God. But I'm just telling, I'm just being honest with you. And we'll pray here in just a minute. I want you to examine your heart because I'm telling you, a lot of people in church today are angry at God. And I can assure you, there's a lot of people in the world today that are very angry at God. They don't want to hear this message that we have because they're, they're, they themselves, something happened and they immediately, it's God. God did this to me. Because if God were sovereign, a good God wouldn't let this happen. And that's immediately where we start going wrong. And we start th- projecting all this stuff on, on Father God. It's just not. The reality is he's already demonstrated his love to us by going to the cross and dying for us while we were still sinners. Now, just because you don't understand everything that's going on in life doesn't mean jump to the conclusion that blame God. Amen. But, the, but I'm telling you, this is a major problem. It's a problem in the church. 
It's a problem in the world. People are mad at God. We take it out on one another. The Bible says we don't battle against flesh and blood, but we battle against principalities and spiritual forces of wickedness and demonic powers. But the reality is, is that deep down, we're angry with God. So I want us to pray, and I'm going to ask this question. Do you deal with anger? Do you really have a problem with anger? And if you do, God really wants to set us free from it. So, Father, we love you. We thank you that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to receive grace and mercy in time of need. I thank you, Lord, that you've already been tempted in every way without sin, so you know what it's like to, to, to feel that anger, but without sin. And you know what it's like when people get upset and hurt and wounded. And so, Lord, we can receive grace and mercy in time of need. But I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would help us to, to come to grips with those feelings of anger where we've been upset, where we've been hurt, been wounded, all the way down to the core. And Lord, if, there's, if we're really upset with you, then first and foremost, say, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for blaming you for things that someone else has done or something else that has happened. And Lord, forgive us because you're not the source of our pain. You're the source of our healing. So forgive us, Lord, from having an angry fist toward you, blaming you for things that happened, when really it, it's the enemy who's constantly bringing <clears throat> death and destruction to our door. It's the enemy that's looking for an opportunity to harass us. It's, the, it's that spirit that's trying to constantly cause us problems. So, Lord, we, just, we come to you and say, Lord, help us. Help us to identify and to, be, and to come clean with this issue of anger. Lord, help us to really get free. Uh, Lord, we love you, we bless you, and we just thank you now because, Lord, you're good, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.